Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us this morning for our August water webinar. Today's webinar is focused on Ask ISCO, Flow Sensor 101, which works best in certain situations. Today's webinar is being led by Daryl Kuda, one of our business development managers. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please utilize the chat function within the Zoom platform and questions will be answered at the end. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to Daryl. Hello, this is Daryl Kuda. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. So today I'm going to talk to you about the Flow Sensors 101, which sensors or technology works best in different uh, situations and applications. Uh, this presentation has been driven by questions that have been submitted um, when you signed up for the, uh, the seminar. So with that, uh, we're going to start with uh, going over some of the basics just for a little background and then uh, go into your questions. So one of the questions we had was uh, which uh, flow meter technology should I use with a weir or flume or open channel? And as you can see, there's a wide variety of uh, technologies available. Um, and so I, we're going to go over some of the more common uh, types of uh, sensors and meters that can be used in common open channel flow measurement. So what technology is available? A couple of questions were uh, what type of sensors or measurement technology is available with weirs or flumes and what sensors can ISCO supply? So what we have is uh, ultrasonic sensors uh, which are commonly used with weirs and flumes and how the ultrasonic sensor works is it uh, transmits a sound wave, reflects off the surface or the water and it's a function of time uh, it measures how long it takes to re receive that return signal to determine what the distance is to the water, which then can calculate what the water level is. Ultrasonic sensors are great with the uh, weirs and plumes because they're non-contact, um, you know, which makes them a little more maintenance free. That's why they're uh, commonly used and a favorite for a lot of treatment plants. Uh, ultrasonic sensors do have a dead band though. Um, a lot of them are around one foot. The ISCO sensors have a one foot dead band, and that's because the transducer needs enough time to transmit the signal and then wait for the return signal to come back. And so the dead band is usually about one foot, and depending on different types of sensor, they, they can be uh, a lot shorter or further away for a dead band. Other type of sensors that are used for weirs and flumes to read your level is a bubbler. And how a bubbler works is it outputs one bubble, usually at a rate of about one to two bubbles per second, and it measures the amount of resistance against that bubble to push it out to get to the surface of the water. And then there's a transducer inside the flow meter that measures the amount of pressure it takes to push that out. In most cases, the bubbler and ultrasonics are interchangeable. I find that's usually a matter of uh, preference with uh, people like the bubbler or the ultrasonic, but uh, one of the key factors in uh, choosing a bubbler over the ultrasonic is if the uh, uh, surface of the water is turbulent or there's foam or steam, um, you know, then you'd want to use a bubbler over that uh, because it's under the water. It isn't uh, reading the surface, and so it's unaffected by the steam, foam, and temperature. Another type of sensor you can use with weirs or flumes is a submerged probe. So when you order your flume, if you let them know that you're going to have a submerged probe, they will make a cutout in the bottom of the flume to uh, recess the submerged probe. And the way they work is they're a differential pressure transducer, and it measures the amount of pressure over the top of the sensor in reference to atmosphere. So what do you do for applications if you don't have a primary device, a weir or flume, uh, such as a round pipe or a rectangular channel? So one of your options are, is an area velocity sensor. As we see here, it's a continuous wave Doppler and it uses a pressure transducer, similar to the one I just talked about, to read the depth of the water, which then calculates the wetted area. And then we send out a Doppler signal to read the frequency shift to get the speed of the water. 
And with that uh, frequency shift, we can determine if we have positive or negative velocity readings. Another way to read area velocity flow in a uh, round pipe or rectangular channel or natural stream would be the non-contact laser flow sensor. So the way the laser flow sensor works is it has an ultrasonic sensor on the back of it to read the distance to the surface of the water. When it knows the distance to the water, it transmits or fires the laser below the surface of the water. It reads the frequency shift of the, um, the water, the particles, air bubbles in the water uh, to determine what the velocity is. And while the laser's on, it's on for two seconds and it takes 5,000 spectral readings to get our velocity reading. And again, with the uh, non-contact laser flow sensor, we can read uh, positive and reverse velocity. So the next question was, uh, which meters are accurate enough for billing? And so what's commonly been used is uh, uh, flumes for uh, for billing meters, uh, and uh, now a lot of people are starting to use the laser flow sensor for uh, billing applications. But the biggest factor in getting accurate flow readings is the application. You could have the most accurate flow meter or level sensor in the world, but if you have a poor ap application, such as uh, insufficient uh, pipe run in front of the the flume or where the the sensor is at. Uh, if the uh, uh, like the flume is not level, or the walls are starting to uh, you know come in, collapse on the flume, uh, you're going to get incorrect uh, flow readings. You know, even though you're getting accurate level readings, the flow calculation is incorrect. So uh, the key is that you know, despite we call them flow meters, they're usually flow calculators, and so uh, we need to you need to be able to provide an accurate um, uh, parameters such as the flume type and so it needs an accurate uh, wall size, pipe size. Uh, the, those are a lot of factors. If the water is really turbulent or we have don't have we have insufficient straight run of pipe or there's like a, a another pipe uh, joining right into the side of it, it's creating a lot of turbulence and now we no longer have uniform flow. So that's the key is we just need uniform flow to get accurate flow readings. Now with a flume now you can use the bubbler or ultrasonic. Uh, it usually gives you an accuracy within uh, two to five percent is uh, common. Uh, if you don't have a flume and you decide to go with the laser flow sensor, you're going to be at, um, uh, within uh, four percent of reading. So the next question that came in was on metering inserts. Uh, are the metering inserts slowly getting phased out? No, uh, there are no plans to phase out the metering insert at this time. And for those of you that are not familiar with the metering insert, the uh, picture on the right side is our ISCO metering insert. They come in various sizes, 6, 8, 10, and 12, and 15 inch. And uh, what it is, it's a, uh, a weir plate inside of the uh, that cylinder, and it has an inner tube around it. It's great for temporary portable applications. You slide the insert into the pipe, inflate the inner tube, and then the water goes over the weir plate, which then we can uh, calculate the flow. And it's used with our bubbler flow meters, like the older 4230, and now with the signature meter. So the uh, 4230 meters, they are getting phased out, or they are, have already been phased out, uh, and they're replaced with our signature bubbler flow meter or you can use it with our ISCO sampler, the 6712 with a 730 module. Um, but the next question that uh, was given was, what's replacing the metering insert? Well, they aren't actually going away, but your option for that is to use an area velocity sensor. So you could use the uh, ISCO 2150 or 350 sensor, or even the laser flow sensor for um, applications um, that you would use the metering insert, or you find that you've tried the metering insert and there's too many solids in there, uh, because it is a weir plate, debris can get hung up on the uh, on that weir, so you may want to go with a uh, non-contact sensor to avoid that problem. Okay. Next question is, how often are they calibrated? So every time you insert a metering insert, you have to do a zero level calibration. 
So you calibrate the zero, open air, and then it has a, a data table built in there to give you the proper uh, flow calculation. The metering insert is not intended to be a permanent op uh, option. So uh, because it has an inner tube on there, you know, you want to uh, you know, check it every couple days to make sure the inner tube hasn't deflated because then water would start to go around the inner tube. So what's the accuracy of metering insert? Um, you're going to be uh, plus or minus um, one gallon per minute. If you're less than 20, 20 GPM, uh, plus or minus two gallon per minute, uh, in the 20 to 40 gallon per minute range, and then uh, plus or minus 5% of reading above uh, 40 gallon per minute. So as you can see with the metering insert, you can read some pretty low flows um, with this uh, simple uh, metering insert. Which leads to the next question, what is the best solution for turbulent flows? Uh, it's a difficult one to, to answer because uh, turbulent flow, it's, well, by nature, is difficult to read. But um, if you need to read level, I would recommend using a bubbler or a pressure transducer uh, because it's below the surface, of the, it's below the water, so um, the surface turbulence isn't uh, affecting it as much. You're going to get more of an average uh, level reading. Um, but the uh, flow calculations are uh, difficult because of uh, non-uniform velocity, uh, so we don't have a good flow profile going through there. So it would make it very difficult to read the velocity. But what you can do to uh, try to straighten the flow out, there's um, flow conditioners, they're sometimes known as flow straighteners. So over on the right side of the screen, uh, we have some examples of um, where you can put uh, tubes in the pipe or uh, veins to try to knock down the turbulence to give you a smoother flow. Now, when you put something like that in the in your uh, pipeline, you know obviously that will not work very well in uh, sanitary sewer because you are going to collect debris on there. Uh, so it, if you have to monitor in the location, uh, you just have to recognize that you're not going to get the most accurate data. Uh, and it'd be better to find a different location, you know, downstream or upstream that will give you less turbulent flow and more uniform flow is what we're really looking for. So does an area velocity sensor read correctly in a full pipe? Yes. Um, and so what happens is the flow rate is proportional to velocity at that time. Um, one thing you may find is that uh, when you're looking at your data, if you have a 12-inch pipe, you might find that your level is reading three foot because of the surcharges, the, the pressure on that pipe. Um, however, your flow meter and the ISCO flow meters are smart enough to know that in the flow calculation that we've hit 100% of the wetted area in that pipe, and then so our level remains constant for the flow calculation and then uh, it's uh, dependent on the velocity to change your flow readings. So um, with the area velocity sensor, you know, we need to uh, know the pipe size or channel site size. We need to know the depth. And so it will uh, calculate the flow correctly, you know, from, you know, one inch all the way up to the, the full pipe. Once it's full, we've hit our 100% wetted area. And then we'll use the uh, continuous wave sensor to read the average velocity. So how do they work for uh, sewer manholes and INI testing? So you can use the area velocity sensor. We've been using them for the last 20 years um, or more for uh, INI testing. So as shown here with the uh, area velocity sensor, it's a great option for INI testing because uh, it, it's easily installed. Uh, you can use, we have a spring ring that uh, you mount the sensor to. You just squeeze it together, slide it in the pipe, let it go, it holds it in place. Uh, so you can do, use that with the uh, pipes that are 15 inches and smaller. Uh, as shown here, we have our 
uh, street level installation tool. So it's a spring ring as well, but it has a cable attached to it. So um, you can use a pole to lower it down in, into the sewer, slide it in the pipe, uh, release the cable, and then the uh, band will expand in the pipe. Uh, the advantage of that is that uh, it's quick and easy to install, saves you the trouble of confined space entry, so it's very cost effective. The, uh, and uh, the other benefit uh, using the 2100 system for uh, monitoring the manholes is that uh, we have uh, optional modems that can be installed, and so they can be just uh, connected to the top of the 2150 module, and then you can uh, call up the meter to have it automatic so you can download the data. Or if you're using our Flowlink Pro system, you can uh, automatically push the data to your server so you can see what's going on real time. And if you wanted, you can even use our Flowlink Global, which would then give you the option to use your smartphone or tablet to view your data via the web. Um, another thing about the 2150 area velocity sensors that you may not know about is that uh, the sensor reads temperature and it uses that to um, uh, calculate the uh, level, compensate for the level of temperature changes. And uh, what I like to use it for is that if there's a rain event with the temperature, you're going to see the temperature is going to drop as you're getting infiltration. So you're going to notice that your level is going up, temperature starts dropping, and it's just one way to confirm that you're having a, uh, a rain event. So the next question was, how can errors be minimized in open channel environments using the ISCO 750 flow module? So 750 flow module is used in combination with our 6712 sampler. And uh, the way you can uh, minimize problems is you can offset that area velocity sensor. So instead of putting it at the six o'clock position in the pipe, you can rotate that off to the side, you know, put it at the seven o'clock position, that way, it's, um, it's off the bottom. All your sediment and debris will uh, uh, settle to the bottom of the channel where we can keep the AV sensor uh, out of the debris. Now, this is dependent on how much water you have in the pipe because um, you still need to make sure the area velocity sensor is submerged. Uh, that way, you can get velocity readings. So I recommend finding a location that has uh, you know, at least uh, two inches of depth or more and a velocity greater than 0.5 foot per second. So as far as with the faster velocity, ideally if you could get an application that has two foot per second velocity, you know, it's going to keep your solid suspended and have less of a chance of collecting debris. Uh, other things you want to look for is uh, there's a desk in tube on the side of the 750 module. I have an arrow pointing to it. Um, the red cap would be removed when it's installed. If the cap, red cap is still on there, uh, we're using that desk hint to reference to atmospheric pressure. So if the red cap is still on, we're not going to reference to atmospheric pressure and you're going to see your levels actually change with the barometric pressure changes. Um, along with that, you want to change the desk hint when it uh, uh, starts to get moist or is used uh, because if the desk hint gets plugged, you're going to have the same problem where you're going to start seeing your levels drifting. So it's an easy maintenance item. Just uh, take the part, the cap apart, uh, put in new desk and beads, and recalibrate. So the other question we had was, uh, why does my low-profile AV sensor return some negative velocity values during storm events? Well, what could happen there is it's uh, picking up uh, eddies, eddy currents. Uh, possibly from debris or pipe joints. And so it's creating swirling in front of that sensor. And so when we send out this cont continuous wave signal, it's taking a snapshot of um, what's in that flow stream. And so it's picking up positive velocities, negative velocities, and it, it may be picking up more of the negative side of that velocity than, that, than it uh, reports a negative reading. So things that could cause that would be if there's a debris that's uh, lodged in front of that sensor, it's uh, creating the swirling, pipe joints, even grout uh, could cause that. So uh, what you may want to do is, you know, offset the sensor again. That may help. Uh, just physically moving it, uh, you know, push it further in the pipe or down. Just move the location 
Because if it's actually, you know, hitting off of a joint or the grout, just uh, moving it a little bit upstream or downstream may avoid that problem. Other things that could cause uh, an issue or negative readings is uh, if you have low level and high velocity, as the picture on the lower left shows, that water starts to ramp right over the top of that sensor and it's creating turbulence in the front of it. So if we got one inch of water and it's ramping over the top of it, it may be picking up some negative velocities because it's changing directions as it has to go over the top of the sensor. So with that, um, and you would want to find a location that may have less of a slope. That way you'd have uh, higher levels, slower velocity to uh, uh, give you better readings. So what's the best option to measure flow in open channels, such as natural streams? Well, we have one option uh, shown here is we have called a stream anchor. And so we can use the area velocity sensors that we've just been looking at. But we have these uh, anchors that are at uh, different lengths. We have a one foot one, I think it's a two or a three foot anchor. And it's, so it's an auger and it just screws into the riverbed and then you can clip the area velocity sensor on top of it to read your level and velocity. Now, as far as it's gonna catch a snapshot of the velocity, probably about one foot in front of it. So uh, it's going to just, uh, estimate that the velocity is uniform all the way across that channel. So uh, trying to read a channel, you're not going to get 100% uh, you know, accuracy, uh, but you are going to be able to monitor the trends. And uh, so when you have an increase in level, you're going to see the velocity is increasing. And so it'll give you a good uh, idea of what's going on through that channel. Other options for uh, stream monitoring is you could use the non-contact area velocity laser flow sensor. So if you tried the uh, air in pipe sensor or in water sensor and you found that uh, debris was starting to catch on the sensor or you had branches that were tearing the sensor out of the flow stream, you may want to go with the non-contact. Uh, this example here, they mounted the laser flow sensor to a bridge. Um, it's using the ultrasonic sensor to read the water level and uh, the laser to read the velocity. Other options is uh, you could use a radar level sensor. So if you had a, you know, if for the radar works great for high, longer distances. So if it was a bridge that was, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet above the flow stream, you could use a radar sensor to read the level. Uh, they won't read the, the velocity, but you could use the level and a Manning's formula to get your flow readings. Other options for large channels is the uh, ADCP channel master from uh, RD Instruments. It's, uh, it mounts on the side, you put it on the side of your uh, flow stream and it uh, uses an ultrasonic sensor to read the depth and then it transmits a pulsed Doppler signal across your flow stream. So, uh, the next question we had was uh, uh, speed calibration, speed detection uh, limits. So what I found is uh, uh, many Doppler or area velocity flow meters, uh, they, they don't require the velocity calibration. Uh, the velocity is calculated from a uh, frequency shift. So what that looks like, you have your area velocity sensor in the bottom of the pipe. It transmits, in our case, the ISCO sensor, a 500 kilohertz continuous wave Doppler signal and then it gets the, um, it measures the return frequency shift to determine the direction and the velocity of the water. So in this case, the, uh, the flow is calculated. But if a calibration is required and your, some flow meters do have a velocity coefficient that you can use to uh, field calibrate your area velocity sensors, um, you may have to profile your flow stream. And so what that looks like is that the, you may take a point velocity meter, handheld velocity meter, and measure it to nine or 10 different uh, locations in that flow stream, come up with an average velocity, and then you can adjust the uh, velocity coefficient on your flow meter to calibrate it to that stream. And the speed detection limit, um, how many, Velocity sensors have a minimum and maximum velocity range. 
Uh, on average, it's going to be around uh, 0.5 foot per second as a minimum and up to 15 foot per second uh, for the maximum limit. Other sensors like the uh, laser flow sensor can read a little bit lower, and uh, there are other meters that can read uh, slightly higher. But the, that's, the general ballpark is going to be at 0.5 up to 15 foot per second for velocity ranges. So interpreting uh, uh, results under non-Manning equations. Um, Manning is only accurate in free flow conditions. It relies on the slope and roughness coefficient to give you accurate flow readings. Uh, if it surcharges, uh, you know, a partially blocked pipe, it's no longer uh, free flowing and you're going to get uh, higher flow readings because it's strictly based off the level uh, to determine what the flow rates are. Uh, I'd recommend using an area velocity sensor instead. And essentially, the Manning will tell you that you have a change in flow based on the level. Uh, you know, your accuracy is out the window, or you have to put in different coefficients, you know, if uh, conditions change. So, what sensor should be used if uh, solids and sediments are problematic? You want to use non contact technology uh, with an ultrasonic or the laser flow sensor would be better for those applications, or you can uh, offset the sensor, as I mentioned before. So now I have a diagram of that, so you can just rotate that sensor off the side, uh, which then allows the debris to pass underneath it and give you accurate flow readings. So the other question is, uh, how, how can maintenance schedules be decreased in the collection system using non-contact sensors? Um, will uh, Minimize your uh, maintenance um, using a flume. You know, theoretically, they're self-cleaning because they accelerate the velocity through the flume uh, to keep sediment from building up. Um, offset the sensor to avoid debris. Uh, using deep cycle marine batteries or solar power, if that's the issue, is uh, replacing batteries. Um, you know, use a larger battery, solar panel. You can uh, keep the units out there for a long time or year-round with solar. And then find locations that have uh, faster, faster velocity, because uh, uh, at two foot per second or higher, the solids are going to remain suspended and hopefully will not catch on your sensor. And next, are micrometers available to monitor storm response in, in sanitary and INI sewers? Let's see. Uh, so this one's a little bit difficult because um, I wasn't quite sure what they're asking on it, but uh, uh, we can use the laser flow sensor for small pipes. We've used them, you know, in six inch pipes. So uh, we used our in-pipe area velocity sensors, the 2150 and six inch pipes. Um, so it, it's possible, um, you know, you just need uh, access to that pipe and, uh, and if it's a sanitary sewer and you have really low flows, the laser flow would be a better option uh, because it's non-contact. It wouldn't uh, uh, get caught up on the debris going through there. But uh, you could also add um, cell phones so you could get alarmed uh, when there's a, a storm event occurring. And, uh, in, or if you use like an analog output or Modbus output, you can tie that into a SCADA system so you can see what's going on real time. Um, another one that just came in uh, late was um, what flow units can be used in open channels and activate an ISCO sampler. So uh, we can use the, um, the technologies we talked about earlier. So ISCO has the 2100 series or the laser or the signature meters. So we can use uh, any of the sensors we were talking about to uh, connect it to an, an ISCO. Uh, logger, and then that will trigger the sampler. If you use the 6712 sampler and the 750 module shown earlier, uh, they can that can also be programmed to uh, trigger off of level or flow rate to uh, tell it when to start sampling. Another question came in about uh, pricing. So as far as pricing, I recommend contacting your local ISCO sales representative or uh, distributor. You can go to our ISCO website, which I have shown on the screen here. And on the top right corner of the screen when you're on our website, there's a find a rep, which I have circled. 
click on find a rep, enter your country or your zip code, and it'll give you all the information you need to contact your local rep. So the, um, as far as which technology should we use, you've seen a lot of different technologies. No one technology should be used for all applications. Your decision is going to depend on if you have a primary device, if it's an open channel, or uh, maintenance, you know, whatever is required is going to help determine, you know, if we're going to go with a non-contact sensor or use a weir or a flume. So with that, uh, we're going to see what questions have come in. Yeah, we've had a few questions come in. Um, again, use the Q&A or chat function in Zoom if you do have follow-up questions here. Uh, the first question is, has the meter, metering insert ever caused an overflow? Has the metering insert ever caused an overflow? Um, I am personally not aware of it, but I could see how it's possible because it is a weir plate. If you had uh, debris, tissues, and stuff going through there, uh, you have a, a, an obstruction in that flow stream. So, um, yeah, there is a chance that it could, you know, especially if, if you've left it in there for a long time, you, debris could build up on the metering insert and uh, start to uh, back up and cause an overflow. So, uh, yeah, with that location or application you're talking about, I would not advise the metering insert, and I would go with the non-contact laser flow sensor. Regarding laser sensors, how often should they be calibrated, and how would the sensors be calibrated? So laser, as far as calibration, it's usually uh, driven by uh, local regulations, how often you need to go out there. But with that being said, I recommend when people ask, I recommend that they go out at least once a year to check on it to calibrate the level. Uh, the velocity does not require calibration. And uh, so at least once a year, if not twice, you should go out there just to check on the application and make sure you don't have any debris, you know, building up in the channel that could be giving you a, a false level or, uh, you know, just, just to do maintenance on the site. Next question is, do you recommend any stilling wells for turbulent flow with an ultrasonic? That is a great option. Um, if you have turbulent flow, um, it, with a stilling well, that will uh, eliminate the turbulent water because it, uh, well, the stilling well by nature is going to uh, equalize the uh, water through that through the flume. So that is an excellent option to uh, have a flume with a stilling well. Then you can use the ultrasonic or bubble or whatever you want. Um, next question is: Any suggestions on how to test AV sensors? to make sure they're working properly. For example, if the face appears to be chipped, I'm not sure if it's still working properly. Um, there are ways to check a AV sensors. And uh, so what we've done in our repair department, and I've seen some uh, field crews do, is they've taken a uh, like a four inch PVC pipe, put a cap on one end of it, and then they take an aquarium air stone and put that in the bottom of the PVC pipe and fill it with water. And when you put your area velocity sensor in there, one, it's going to read the water depth, so you can test that part. And two, it's going to read the speed of the bubbles coming up towards the surface. Bu bubbles rise at a rate of about one foot per second, so it's just a good test just to see that it's operating. And uh, it, if you put your other sensors in that same location, you're going to find you're going to get some uh, really consistent readings. What would be the best approach for monitoring dry overflow pipes? So dry overflow pipes, um, with that, uh, normally I've seen uh, ultrasonic sensors, so they would have an area velocity sensor, the, um, the in-pipe area velocity sensor or the laser on the main channel, and then uh, have a, a second uh, ultrasonic sensor on your overflow. Or you could put an area velocity sensor in on the, the overflow channel as well. Um, it won't uh, it won't damage the AV sensor sitting in a dry pipe. How do you know when to replace desiccant? Are there any pitfalls to avoid? As far as desiccant, they change colors, so it starts. 
I think it starts out the uh, ours starts out orange or amber, and then it changes to a green or a darker color. Um, and uh, some other desiccant uh, out there is, uh, starts out purple and turns pink. Uh, so you want to look at the side when you uh, order your desiccant. They'll have a essentially a chart on the side of it indicating what's uh, good and bad. And depending on where you're at, you know the desiccant uh, may last a week. And then you're in a drier environment, the desiccant may last six months to a year. Uh, so you're just going to just observe the uh, change in color to tell you when to uh, change the desiccant out. But uh, as far as changing it too often, no, I don't see any pitfalls in that. But if you uh, wait too long, um, the desiccant could become moist and then uh, essentially uh, block the referenced atmosphere, which would then result in a drifting level. Um, how to calibrate the lever level sensor in the field? As far as a couple ways to calibrate a level sensor, one, uh, if you can get into the flow stream, uh, you just take a ruler, put it in the water. Um, I've seen different methods for uh, calibrating that, uh, taking a, a Crayola um, marker, or, you know, just a marker, and put that on the side of your metal ruler. And uh, so when you put it in the water, it washes away the uh, you know, the ink, and so you can see where your water level is. Uh, there are other powders that are available that you can actually put on a stick, and then when you put it in there, it washes the powder off, and then you can uh, read your level. Now, with an ISCO 2150 area velocity sensor, because it's temperature calibrated, you can actually uh, calibrate that to zero in open air and then put it in the flow stream. And I found that's been more accurate in a lot of applications because if you have high velocity and you put a ruler in that water, you know, it rooster tails up the side of it, and then, you know, you're going to be within probably a half inch where uh, calibrating in open air is going to give you more accurate level reading. Great. I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you to Daryl for walking through all these questions. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions, Daryl's contact information is on the screen right now. Um, or you can reach out to us through Zoom, and I will pass this along to the appropriate parties as well. Um, so once again, thanks to everyone for joining us, um, and have a great rest of your day. Our August water webinar will be happening at the end of August, so more information on that webinar and topic will be coming out um, after the beginning of August. So be on the lookout for that information next week.